Don't be a dick. Just take it. Yeah. <laughs> Got the lens cap on you, dick. <laughs> 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 Recording and playing live, you have to prefer playing live reviews as a musician because it's all about the feedback you get from people and that sort of immediate audience reaction. There's nothing quite like that feeling of people appreciating your music, and obviously that happens with CDs and what you're selling as well. But you don't get to see that reaction; you just get people telling you about it afterwards. And um, I think recording is well, it's a much slower process, um, it's sort of painstaking. You've got to make sure everything's right and go over things a hundred times, so it just kind of loses the immediacy and the, and the kind of power of what you do. For me, I guess the band's always been about playing live. Not to say I don't enjoy recording, but the, uh, the thrill you get from the, the crowd response playing live is immense, and you can't really match it with anything else. I, of course, love writing and creating new music, and uh, the music which we write as a band it's something that I love, it's the sort of music that I've listened to at home. I love the, the melodies and the sort of sombre, depressing feeling behind the music itself. I enjoy recording, but uh, yeah, obviously like, the writing process and the recording process is cool, but there's nothing like playing live for me. It's all about the performance. I don't just play the drums, I actually make the performance out of the whole thing. I have a great time at any show we play. If there's three people there that love our music, that are getting into a show, then I have a great time. I'm there to please anyone, that's, that's exactly why we're there to play the show. And hopefully new people that see us and haven't heard us before will get into it as well and become fans from that. A lot of people say they're disappointed by playing smaller shows after playing you know, big festival appearances, but to me, if we go somewhere and play to 30 people that have come just to see us, that's a great thing. Playing a headline show to our own fans is a definitely a special thing.
don't really remember what made me want to um, uh, pick up a guitar in the first place. So it's uh, somehow at, at the age of about ten, um, I went from being in love with racing cars and wanting to be a, a racing car driver um, to wanting to be a rock star. And my my, my first my first inspiration was uh, Slash. I, I really wanted to be him, and I, I, I still do, in some ways. I started singing um, in my church choir when I was seven, and then I joined my local children's choir and I sang in that, dressed in a little blue and white sailor suit, very fetching. And, um, and I think at some stage I decided that wasn't quite where I wanted to go with it, so I um, looked into kind of opera, musical theatre and that kind of thing, but that didn't really appeal either. And then I was about 14 I joined a band, and I was kind of sold after that. I was influenced originally by uh, people like uh, John Cole and Jeff Rich from Status Quo and Roger Taylor from Queen and all sorts of kind of old rock stuff. I joined my first band at the age of about 12, 11 or 12, playing sort of standard rock, bluesy kind of cover stuff. And by the age of 14 I joined the original incarnation of Season's End as a, a spotty little shit. I became interested in metal music at quite a young age, I guess about 14 years old. We were getting into Bon Jovi and Metallica. I guess the transition of listening and playing into playing in a band is a pretty standard one, which most people take. I think most people want to be in a band, most people want to be on stage. And uh, luckily for me, it's just a thing I've, I'm able to do now. I started out as... Um... Uh, as, a, as a growler in uh, in, in my first uh, thrash metal band, um, um, but I was I was never very comfortable with kind of proper singing. Uh, that that is only I don't know that that that's a more recent thing. But um, I, I'm really starting to enjoy it now. Now now that I think I've found my voice, um, it's um, I, I'm working on the expression a lot more. As a singer. I'm influenced by the people I've had my training from, from um, singing teachers, from other people in the classical world and things like that who have taught me about the technique of singing and certainly as a singer the worst thing you can ever do is try and sound like anyone else um, and I hope I don't. So that's, that's a really difficult question because I never want to say I'm influenced by this or that in case people think I'm trying to emulate that sound. At the same time, there's, I have such a broad listening base. Um, and I think that's, I hope that comes across in what I do vocally and vocal line writing wise because my listening is so varied from classical to jazz to pop to rock to metal that I hope there's kind of little elements of all of that in my life. You've probably got eight. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <Hey. laughs> Marvellous. All the best. Your kind inquiry, sir. <laughs> Dead baby shards. Tomorrow night I'm gonna be the last to go to bed. <laughs> wait, wait for a few hours and then and then start filming and it'll be it'll be messy. I think we could have done without playing Bloodstock, really, couldn't we? Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't really that important to our career, yeah. I don't think. I mean, we, we, were, we were doing fine in the goth scene. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I mean, we were really getting somewhere. And then this bloodstock thing came along and it, it kind of distracted us. And, you know, all these, all these new people started listening to us. And, you know, we, we, we had an agenda from, from the off to, you know, really make it in the goth scene. And it's just really kind of fucked up our plans now. I even got, really got, got, rid of my, uh, got rid of my frill shirts and, and my lipstick inadvertently. <laughs> I gave them to Marcus from uh, Crimson Tears. I got to be free! I got to be free! Um, I think the idea of touring over broad, um, over broad? <laughs> Undersea and over broad. <laughs> Uh, I think the idea of terror. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just for the record, I've said it before. Endorse me, you bastard. <laughs> I think I've written one riff, haven't I? No. <laughs> no, that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> we we have to get along, really. There's there's no choice, really. I mean, the, this is kind of the the best band we could ever hope to be in. So we've got to get on. Standing on your mother's porch. Okay. <laughs> Can't stop this thing we started. How do you feel that we get on as a band? I really don't feel that I get on with you very well at all. You basically annoy me constantly. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you are so. We asked you, rather, or he did, loads of cool questions. Ask us some cool questions. Ask some fucking questions. Oh, my God. He's so good. Oh, fuck off. I joined a friend's band because I, I, I really liked the direction they were going in and, um, and that started to fall apart um, again. I, I hope it wasn't anything to do with me. Although it did lead to um, uh, us kind of rebranding what we had. Um, um, that, that's eventually what, what became Season's End. And after a few lineup changes, um, I mean, Becky was originally on um, on keyboards and, and backing vocals and didn't actually turn up to some of the gigs because um, because you know, sometimes she couldn't make it, but she she wasn't that big a part of it at, at the time that it, you know, it, we could we could go and do a gig without her, which you know it's a um, I never dream of going out and playing a gig with, without any of us now. Um, but uh, yeah, she she slowly made her way yeah, to the front of the stage, um, and as soon as she did, then it, it really started to take off. People started to notice her properly. A few years ago, I was playing in a band with a, a few friends from back home, <laughs> playing more sort of black metal music, and this band happened to play a show with the old incarnation of Season's End, with Becky playing keyboards and so on, different front person. Um, I became very friends with the band then, and I met Becky again at university. And soon after that, they shifted their lineup around a little. Becky became just a solo singer in the band, and uh, they just asked me to play keyboards for them. It's a bit strange for me because originally I was a guitar player and I was only playing keyboards to fill in effectively with my friend's band as a favour. But I fancy doing something new and uh, from then on I've just been playing keyboards for the last three or four years. Just before 
Christmas last year, um, uh, Daryl and Tom decided to leave. Um, we, we kind of knew it was coming, but it, it was only a matter of time because it, it wasn't um, it wasn't really their baby like it is the um, I mean, for the four of us. It's it, you know it's, it's really our our thing, and we're we're prepared to. Um, do anything to die for it, to support it. Well, maybe not that far, but at least lose our jobs for it. Uh, well, I'm know. prepared to die for it. Uh, <laughs> worse, right? Um, and uh, so the uh, a couple of the guys that are tech for us um, uh, have, have stepped in, and it's um, and if any, we only had like I don't know three. Three rehearsals, two, two or three proper rehearsals, um, with it, and yeah, they've just been brilliant. It's like it's like nothing has changed. Really. Uh, you know, the the, the energy is there, and they're, you know, they're really behind it, and it's really cool. Yeah. And one of them's called Dave, which is just great because yeah. that's not confusing at all. Having three Daves in a six-piece band yeah. in any way, shape, or form. I think any group of people you spend a lot of time with, you're going to have your rows. Um, in I think we don't we don't so much row as bicker like irritating small children. I think it's getting better recently actually. I hate to say it. I hate to say that you still annoy me constantly. Oh of course. Yeah. But I think we've learned to tolerate each other a lot better recently. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think I any any it. any amount of time you spend with a with one group of people, if you spend, you know, a lot of time it's quite high pressure time as well well because you wanting to be successful and you're trying to make something of yourselves, so mm -hmm. kind of a lot of what you're doing kind of hinges on the fact that you get along. <laughs> yeah, and if you feel that so. someone's holding you back or stunting it in some way, then you get a bit disappointed. Yeah, so... That's not usually the case. But. No, I think, I think the four of us all get on really well. Yeah. yeah. Devoured. Look at that mess we've made. Look at the state of that. Of that there. That's... Ugh. Look at the state of that there. <laughs> Carl, he's a bit blurry. He's not normally this blurry. Oh, there he is. Carl's uh, drum tech extraordinaire. <laughs> Drummer with no <laughs> fork. <laughs> How do you maintain that sixth most shaggable woman in metal? <laughs> <laughs> it's a regular drinking of beer for the men, which makes well, them believe that I'm attractive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I can't hang around here all day. <laughs> this is a real man. <laughs> yes, freshly squeezed orange juice. <laughs> this is a finger. Two fucking weeks I've been here. Not a single bit of food. Not a single fucking bit. Look at these cunts. He's <laughs> a northerner. You can tell he's northern by the state of his car. <laughs> You cunt! <laughs> this is what a season's end gig is all about. Disassembling a stupidly big drum kit. This is a professional lighting setup and stage entertainment set. This is the van of bum fun. And that is the bum of fun. 
Anything Things have changed now, though. This much talent. <laughs> Seasons what? This much talent. Actually, not down yet. This is the rack of unnecessaryment. I'm game. I've got things, really. forward without any hands, without hurting my face. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Okay. If you, if you want to <laughs> go on video and point at things, just go to a laser for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I hurt my face. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again. No, 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 it was cool kind of doing the drums and things that we actually did in the studio um, but we did a lot of it ourselves and it was, well, it was just a very very painstaking process. We all learned so much about the recording process while we were doing it. It was incredibly boring at times, it was the most tedious, frustrating thing and then other times it was really exhilarating because we felt like we were getting somewhere. It really depended on the day, you know, sometimes you'd come in and you'd do a whole day's recording of one song and certainly vocal line wise, so, you know, I'd come out of the vocal booth crying and Paul would go, no, that was shit, go back in and do it again and just sometimes hideous and just sometimes amazing and you knew you were doing what you wanted to be doing. I'm quite pleased with the way that the fading light has turned out. It, it took us a long time and a lot of effort to record in the first place and the finished product the first time round was, it was good and we were happy with it at the time but we always knew we could have done better. Um, given the time to think about what we've done, and you know, there was things which we knew we had to improve, and we had newer ideas for artwork, things we could have, we knew we could have done differently and much better. Given the chance to re-release the album and repackage it and remix it was a, a great thing for us, as we could have, you know, we'd, we'd built up all these thoughts over a couple of years, and then we were given the chance to put them into action. Re-releasing an album is quite a scary thing. I think we all found it quite daunting because. We didn't want to con anyone into thinking it was a new product, but at the same time we wanted the opportunity to repackage and to do things like spend money on it that we haven't been able to do before. I'm personally really, really happy with the new mix of it. It brought out all the things that the first time around, because of budgeting and all the rest of it, we couldn't do ourselves. Um, so that was really exciting for me because it suddenly sounded a lot more like the record I wanted to put out. Um, and artwork-wise, obviously, having real photographers and real artworky people working on it is going to be a lot better than you know a bunch of musicians can put together. So. Being picked up by a record company was obviously a great move for us. To be honest I wasn't particularly surprised and um, in, a, in a cocky way I've always been confident with our standard of material and our performances as a band. So I, I thought it was just a matter of time until, until we got picked up and until the album was put out there. I mean I don't want to appear completely up my own ass, but um, I think it's good to be confident about the things you do. And if you don't have that confidence, then you can't, you don't have the drive, and you need the drive to get somewhere.
Within the female metal genre, there's there's a, many different styles and many different ideas going around. But um, throughout what I've been listening to, I can't seem to find another band that sounds very similar to what we're doing. Not to call ourselves unique, of course. I wouldn't be that bold, but I think we do have a, our own sound. I think a lot of uh, the other kind of female-fronted metal bands. Um, a very kind of power metal orientated. Not all of them, just generally speaking. Um, but I, I don't know. I think we're the we're the only band that's kind of uh, got as much kind of prog influence uh, and as much kind of atmospheric kind of almost Pink Floydy kind of influence. I often find myself answering people's questions of what does your band sound like. Over the years, you were. You learn what to say and what not to say. I'm, the one which I'm using at the moment is female fronted melodic metal. It's quite a broad term, but if you use any sort of descriptive words like gothic or you know, melancholic, then people immediately group you somewhere else. So Dave, th thoughts on the gig tonight? I enjoyed it because I like any gig really, to be 
honest. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, I'm so, a bit more of a gig snob than you, apparently. I think you are. I just like, I like any gig if I can actually stand up for it. The only one I didn't really enjoy was Cambridge. Cambridge, because, because, oh yeah. Because if I uh, took a step back, I tripped over and fell into your, well not even your drum kit, the other guy's drum kit. That other guy's, oh, well that wasn't, I'm not totally convinced it was a drum kit, to be honest. I think it was a drum play set. Yeah. Question, or do you have something else to say? Oh. <laughs> right. Let's not do this at all. I've gone off the entire idea and I haven't drunk anything. I just challenge you to eat a vindaloo and you die. <laughs> yeah. Because you're a nonce. Are we gonna hey, I'm not that much of a nonce. I can eat the hottest curry there is, which is blatantly uh, chicken tikka masala. <laughs> That's clever, that is. It's what? Dry water. <laughs> it's like little children. <laughs> There are small children pleasant as well. Pleasant? <laughs> Symbols aren't symmetrical, I'm not happy about it. <laughs> what do you think about Dodd having a drum roadie? I think it's fucking slack of the little shit. And if he's watching, <laughs> fuck off! Are you filming all this, man? No. This is really dull shit. <laughs> That's the kitchen. If you edit it well, it's different. This Paul's poo stick. <laughs> Tom, have you heard the new thing? What's that? Um, cracking off some Ill illegitimate knuckle children. Yeah, that's right. Gonna call. That's Ghostbusters! <laughs> Something weird and yes. okay, You're gonna call. Ghostbusters! <laughs> 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 Oh! We I think the the general theme for uh, for the songs on the fading lights and um, our stuff generally is a. It, it, it seems to be expressing a, a sense of loss. When Seasons End started writing The Fading Light, um, we were quite a lot younger than we are now. Um, we were sort of all late teens, early twenties. And so I think that obviously our maturity and our kind of growth in life experience is going to come across in the music, and certainly in the lyric writing and that sort of thing. The more life experience you have, the more sort of subject base you've got to write about. We always tend to write about um, Kind of, uh, I suppose they're kind of tragic love songs, in a way. I think The Failing Light was a, a good first album for us, and I think it showed where we were at the time. But bearing in mind a lot of the material was actually written pre-2003, and we're now in 2006 on that. We've progressed a long way since then, kind of as musicians uh, and as people, really. Uh, not to mention lineup changes as well. So. You know, we're a completely different band now. The material on the fading lights, um, a lot of it had been kicking about for, for a while. Um, and that it's, I don't know, it's, it's where we were as a band at the time. And um, 
but since then we've done so many gigs and the, the crowd has become a lot more responsive as well. Um, and we, we started to enjoy ourselves a lot more just being on stage and that's kind of come through in the music that we're writing now. It's a, it's a lot more energetic. Um, and uh, it's, uh, the new stuff is, uh, is geared towards the performance as well. Whereas the old stuff didn't didn't tend to be as it was a bit more um, it was a bit more introspective I suppose. I think from touring uh, the Failing Light, we've uh, and we've got been quite influenced by the whole live thing because we did so many live shows and so much touring that uh, we kind of really figured out that the that the energy of our show is kind of really where we're at. So I think that's kind of reflecting in uh, in the material that we're writing for the second album. I'd say the the material is more straight to the point. The, the hard hitting songs are harder hitting straight in there and the softer songs will, will hopefully show a lot more uh, mature emotions in comparison to the first album material. I hope that there will be a good balance of uh, the heavy and the soft um, because that's what Seasons End have always been about. Writing sessions are definitely a collaborative experience. What happens is that um, Little Dave or Paul might come up with a riff, or sometimes I might, um, and then we all meet up, and I get drunk and fall asleep, and the guys write a good song, and then, um, then uh, no, we we all get together and we sort of bring our ideas together, and it it sort of depends how somebody's how somebody's writing at that time, because I think like any any artistic process, some months you have a really good run of things to talk about or to write about or you come up with some really good musical ideas and you're really happy with things and another month it's just a load of shit and you think, oh I can't do this and you throw it away. But hopefully while that's happening somebody else is having a good time writing a lot of stuff. So it's, it's all a mixture. I think a couple of the recent songs on the album I have quite a lot of input into the choruses and um, coming up with sort of riffs and chord progressions and stuff, which I was really happy with. Um, and our latest song has been a little bit more vocal melody like writing wise, which is something a bit different for us, which has been quite exciting. My biggest kind of input into the season's end isn't really just as a drummer. Um, it's I mean I'm a, I'm a lyricist and I write original riffs and, and melodies as well. Myself and uh, Dave, little Dave, do a lot of writing together for uh, the original material. I tend to write quite a lot of the lyrics. Um, but again, it's a collaboration. Sometimes Paul might come up with an idea. It might even be sort of a few lines. Sometimes it's half a song. And so he say to me, what do you think of this? Or I've got this idea, but I'm not quite sure how to put it into these words. So, and you know, we always share everything with each other and you know, Paul will look at that and go, no, that sounds like he's trying to say the wrong thing. And it, it's, it's not a one, certainly not a one person job. Ideas for um, uh, musical ideas and lyrical ideas tend to come from, um, I don't know, it's just, uh, extreme situations, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm particularly moved by something, um, in either, um, you know, in e either a, a sad way or a, an angry way, um, uh, it, it's, Music and, and lyrics is kind of an outlet for that. So rather than punching someone or or getting really depressed, it um, it just it comes to my head in a you know kind of musical form. Um, and it's great to be able to kind of express yourself and that have and have that outlet, have a creative outlet. <laughs> What would you say about people, narrow-minded people saying you only have a female singer because sex sells? Yeah, pretty much. Aye, 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 fucking hell. God, spot the northern boys. They are. Sorry, John. It's all right, I don't care. Somebody in your bunch of shandy drinking puffs can drink. Yeah, he has to put up with us with our raw, Right. I say, rather so jolly bloody good. Excellent, we're in a metal band. <laughs> Frankly, I think I'd rather put up with that than you, you loud northern cunt. <laughs> How does it feel to have a successful metal festival in Britain? Absolutely brilliant, yeah. And who's the best band you've ever put up? Uh, oh, amongst numerous bands, we 
put on those papers that I'm making season's end on it. Um, a bit female singery metal-y type. Yeah, I, I can't compare you to any other female fronted band out there because you'll beat me with a stick. Does the band have an overall vision? I think each of us individually have our own vision. <laughs> Fuck off. I'm a drummer, not an interviewist. Uh. E. E. <laughs> Every single one of the members of Season's End is a bunch of cunt. Is that better? And collectively. <laughs> a school of cunt. A school of country. <laughs> oh, I went there. <laughs> I would love to go and cover Christina Aguilera in jam. Me too. And roll around. How this shit happens when we're all sober. How does it there's a fridge. It's empty. Empty? This is no good. Ah! Hello. Hello. Is this our camera? Yes! Hello! Hello! Hello. Hello. My sex life has been great since I've been at Season Dead. Yes. Does it have a particular message that it's, it's trying to get across? I think as long as we spread the message of the Lord, then we're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> are you a Season Dead fan? Who? Why aren't you stalking? What? You should be stalking my name. I, I, I was, I was a Marilyn Paul fan. Right there, look! I know! Stalk! Ew! Oh, you've got legs now. Kiss the camera, go on. <laughs> you shit! Anyone else? Oh no! <laughs> in Nottingham. No! <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on the gig tonight, Dave? Deciding what to wear for stage is actually a really difficult thing to do. I think especially as metal folks, you don't tend to be that image obsessed. It tends to be more about the music. So kind of presenting yourselves to an audience and having a united front is quite hard. Um, not as difficult for me as it is for the guys. Um, I tend to just kind of flounce around and frilly sleeves and go, oh, that's nice, and then they have to choose something to wear. So I think that kind of uniformity in the background is really important to us, having the guys all look like they're part of a unit rather than all looking like a bunch of individuals who've just kind of shown up and gone, oh, I think I'll play a gig today, you know, that's important to us. We like to make a great balance of emotional music and something that's accessible and something that the fans can get into live. We, we, um, we do have a few catchy choruses that We've noticed a lot of the fans have been learning the words, even to the newer songs that haven't been released, which is quite an impressive thing. Um, it's always goes to my emotion. Everyone sings along live, and it's, it's a fantastic feeling to hear the vocals coming back. Uh, we recently watched a uh, a camcorder recording of one of our shows, and uh, you could hear the guy a couple of rows back screaming the vocals <laughs> along to the song. You know? That was certainly quite fun to watch, and a great feeling came from that. After Bloodstock, going and playing smaller gigs again, um, it was a very strange feeling. I wouldn't it wasn't a negative one because, you know, we suddenly found that people were coming to our gigs that we were getting bigger crowds than before. So obviously the exposure that playing such a big stage got us had obviously moved us up a little level, which is great. Um, going back to playing smaller stages, it's just. It's just a very different experience. It's so much more intimate in terms of, you know, sometimes your crowd can be sort of stood this far in front of you and you've got them right in your face while you play, which obviously somewhere bigger like Bloodstock, they're much further removed from you. So it's just a really different experience. It's certainly not a negative one. We have such, um, such dedicated supporters. Um, it's, it's really cool hanging out with them, just... Um, yeah, just just having a drink with them, having a laugh. Um, uh, and, uh, because of the nature of our music, it, do, it does kind of um, it does get people on a kind of emotional level, and 
um, and they can be quite kind of philosophical about it. And I, I, I love it when um, when people come up to you and, and say how much you know how much you know our, our songs mean to them. You know, that's that's the best. That's the best thing about it. It's really hard to tell when you've been working in a band. Um, it's, it's very hard to know when you sort of start being recognised as such. Because um, you work really, really hard and you write songs and you record demos and you throw those away because you realise they're shit. And you record some more and you write some more songs. And you play gigs and you play a lot of really tiny gigs in a lot of crappy places on a Thursday night that three people come to. And you do that for a long time, usually a few years, if not more. And then, you know, one day you happen to send your CD off to a promoter or something and put you on at a bigger festival or something. And I think the biggest one for us, as a younger band, as a new band, was the Whitley Gothic weekend um, in 2002. Um, and that was a massive deal for us because that was about a thousand people and it was really, really huge. It was a very strange thing because I think we got there and people were like, They've got a drum kit and hair and they play real instruments and oh my god they're a live band um, they're not goth. I think there are a lot of um, a lot of bands that, that write music for that you know, for, for a moment. Everyone picks up on it because because it's exciting. Everyone plays it to death and then it's forgotten about and it's, it's thrown away. It's it's, it's disposable. Um, I'd much rather have something that maybe you can't get into instantly but just the more you listen to it, the more it kind of um, buries itself in you and you keep coming back to it and thinking, yeah, this, this, is, this is good stuff. And that, that's the sort of music I'd love to write. I have high hopes <coughs> for myself and for the band. Obviously, the larger the stage, the bigger the crowd, the better. I'm, I haven't got any false illusions just yet, but I'd, I'd like to see everything progress to a much higher level make a bigger crowds, yeah. have a lot of fun. The main thing I want to kind of achieve with, with Season's End Music is, is turning up to a, a gig one day and, uh, and managing to get an entire audience both head-banging and crying at the same time.